Welcome. It's great to, to be with you again on this Thursday uh, afternoon and evening. We're talking today about the Messianic Psalms some more. We're going to focus on especially two of them and hopefully get to a third today. Uh, but we're, we're going to, to be looking uh, in some detail at these, more so perhaps than at some of the others that we've, we've looked at. Um, so we've already covered Psalm 2, Psalm 8, Psalm 16, and Psalm 40 in our previous lesson. Today we're going to look at Psalm 22, uh, Psalm 110, and if we have enough time, we'll, we'll look at Psalm 45 as well. But uh, I want us to begin with Psalm 22, and this is perhaps one of the most... Uh, most used passages um, when it comes to the Lord's Supper. We would, uh, this is very often read before the Lord's Supper because it is, or parts of it are, because it's a very good description, a very powerful emotional description of uh, Jesus' crucifixion. And I think it's very clear, a, clearly a prophecy of, of his crucifixion. And we see uh, the, a reference to it during the crucifixion. In Matthew 27, verse 46, it says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which, that is, uh, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, so, that, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is the very first line of Psalm 22, which is describing what he's going through. And so, there's a, uh, a bit of debate, I suppose, among brethren as to what this really means. Oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's a number of ways that people have approached this. Uh, one uh, way that, that I think is not thought through very well is to say that uh, when he, Jesus says this, he's simply calling people's attention to Psalm 22 and uh, letting them know that that's a prophecy of what's going on. I don't think that makes sense that uh, he's using words from the psalm, but the words from the psalm don't actually apply to him. It does. So it's in the psalm. It, it's, it's stated there at the very beginning of the psalm. So whatever it means in the psalm is what Jesus means by it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Other brethren have taken this to mean that Jesus was actually uh, separated spiritually from God. That because Jesus took our sins on himself, uh, that God viewed him as a sinner and could not be in fellowship with him. And there was a spiritual separation, which is, of course, the would be the greatest pain of any because of his close relationship with God. Uh, he's going through physical pain, emotional pain, and then this spiritual separation from God as God is viewing him as a sinner on the cross. And um, I can understand uh, why people would take that position, but I don't agree with that position. I, I believe that there are some things in the context of, of uh, the crucifixion as well as in Psalm 22 that would uh, say otherwise. And so I want us to, to look at that briefly here before we uh, get into uh, the rest of it. But uh, this is the first question that I asked. Uh, it's already there in the comments. In what way was Jesus forsaken by God? In Psalm 22. So as we we're looking at at uh, I'm going to go through some arguments why I don't believe this is talking about a spiritual separation uh, where 
God is viewing Jesus as a sinner, and therefore they are separated uh, in the sense that every other sinner is separated from God. Um, I'm going to go through some thing reasons why I don't believe that's the case, uh, but go ahead and, and see if you can answer uh, this question, in what way was Jesus forsaken by God? And if you believe that it was, uh, it means that he was spiritually separated from God. You can you can answer that, uh, but uh, I'm going to go through some reasons why I don't believe that's true. In Luke twenty uh, twenty three, and verses forty two through forty seven, uh, the th this thief on the cross says uh, to Jesus, "Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom." And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. <clears throat> Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. So here's, there's a few things in this passage that uh, indicate to me that God is not viewing Jesus as a sinner. Uh, one is that he says he's going to be in paradise. Now, I, I don't... Uh, I guess there's a lot I don't understand about this, and maybe somebody could argue with me about it, but I don't believe that someone who dies in a condition of, of being separated from God would go to paradise. And yet Jesus was absolutely confident, and he knew, that he would be in paradise. Um, also, we, we see him calling out in verse 46, calling to the Father, and not in uh, in just anguish and not not saying you know I uh, why you know I I don't know why you're not listening to me which is what it sounds like when he says my God my God why have you forsaken me but he's saying God Father into your hands I commit my spirit he's trusting God with his spirit and this is you know god is still working with him in all of this this is not a spiritual separation that i see here and then when he he dies the centurion glorifies god which means he's speaking the truth saying certainly this was a righteous man he did not die as a sinner he died for the sinners but he died as a righteous man and uh, so there, there's a number of things here that indicate to me that this is not saying uh, that Jesus was actually separated from God. Later on, when we talk about Psalm 110, we're going to see in Hebrews another passage that I think helps us to understand this, uh, but we're not going to cover it uh, in this context, but, but we'll, we'll come across that later. All right, but let's go ahead and read Psalm 22. And, uh, and as we read it, maybe you can think about what, what does it mean that he, God has forsaken Jesus? Um, okay, before we get into that, we have a question. Don't all saved dead persons go to paradise? Uh, yes, I believe so. I believe all saved dead persons would go to paradise, all those who are considered righteous because of forgiveness, or in the case of Jesus, because he never sinned. Of course, there's nobody to save him if he sins. And, uh, and you know, there's a lot of things there that are confusing to me, and that's... But uh, especially if you take the position that he was considered an actual sinner by God... Uh, on our behalf. I don't understand how that would work. That doesn't mean uh, that I understand things perfectly, uh, but I don't understand how that would work. Um, but yes, all saved persons would go to paradise or all righteous people. Of course, Jesus wasn't saved by anyone. He's the one saving everyone. And so he would go there because he's righteous in himself. He is a righteous man. Uh, he was not a sinner. And he was not considered a sinner by God, I don't believe. 
he died in the place of the sinner, that doesn't mean that he was considered to be a sinner. Um, all right, Psalm 22 then. Let's read this. I'm going to try to put uh, em a lot of emotion into it as we go, the emotion that's there in the psalm, uh, so that we can hopefully get a good idea of what it's saying uh, besides just the words, uh, because it the emotion's there in the words, but if we don't read it with the emotion, we sometimes miss it. All right. To the chief musician set to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you, they trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. At the ends of the world shall, sorry, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him. It shall be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. All right, so uh, nobody wanted to answer question number one, and that's okay. Uh, it you can get into trouble, I suppose, with with others if you if you're not real sure of uh, how you want to answer it, or you might want to have more time to explain your answer. So that's fine if you don't want to answer it. But but I think this one shouldn't uh, be a problem for anybody to answer. So uh, question number two is what type of psalm? is Psalm 22, and as I say, there can be more than one right answer. 
And some psalms are not easy to categorize as just one thing. I mean, we're calling this a messianic psalm, but it's also other types of, of psalms as well. Uh, so uh, you can list out what types of psalms you think this would fit into. Um, so you can go ahead and put those, those answers in as we go. But I want us to, to, to go back and look here at this idea, this question number one of what, in what way was Jesus forsaken? So I saw a little bit of a debate recently among some brethren who were, where one was uh, wording it in the sense that, uh, I think he, he put it this way, that Jesus wasn't actually forsaken, he just felt forsaken. And I believe I've probably put it almost exactly like that uh, at times. That's probably not the best way to put it. As the, the brother who was responding to him said, was Jesus mistaken? You know, uh, he, he indicates he was actually forsaken. Did he just feel forsaken or was he forsaken? And I, I understand that, that the Psalms are dealing with emotion. And that's why I've, I've put it that way in the past, that he felt forsaken by God. But I think there's more to it than that. I, I do think that there's a sense in which he was forsaken. And uh, so he's, he's not saying, why do I feel forsaken? He's asking, why have you forsaken me? And so the question is, what does that mean? And, you know, for some people, it seems like, well, that must mean that God turned his back on Jesus. They were separated spiritually, uh, which would happen because Jesus was considered a sinner as he's dying in the place of sinners. But that's not what we find in this psalm. What we find in this psalm is that God is not helping him. He's not saving him from this physical suffering. And that's what we're going to see when we get to Hebrews as well. But, but he's crying out to God for help to save him from physical death. That's what he's talking about here. And God is going to hear him. That's one of the things that this, this psalm is, is about, uh, that God will hear him. But, uh, he, he talks here about this, this idea of God forsaking him, but what does it mean? In the context of the psalm, I believe it means that God forsook him and that he allowed these terrible things to happen to him. Uh, and, uh, and certainly he did. God allowed that to, to happen to him. He did not help him and save him from this terrible death. And, uh, the question then is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I don't think Jesus was confused about why this was happening. I think he understood it perfectly. That's where the emotion certainly does come in. This is the, the language of the Psalms. Uh, Brittany says this is a, the type of Psalm is a lament. And that's what at least the first part of this is. It's a lament. And this is exactly the type of language you find in the other Psalms of lament. This is the type of language Jesus had in his heart. The Psalms were in him. Uh, and I think if we had the Psalms in us the way that he does as well, this is the type of thing we would say, even if we understood what was going on. But, but this is, this is the, the type of language of the lament. And so this is, why have you forsaken me? It's not necessarily a question of confusion. Uh, and in the case of Jesus, I don't believe it was a question of confusion at all, but it's a, it's a calling out to God for help. It's a calling out to God for him to help him in this situation, which he does, even though it's through the resurrection of the dead. But, uh, but he does help him. He does hear him in his cry. All right, so... Um, one of the things I want us to, to look at, uh, which is just, it, it's almost a side point, but I think it's fairly important, uh, for good students of the Bible to be aware of this type of thing. 
especially if you're going to be talking with people who do know about it and uh, will bring it up. So in verse 16, he says, it says, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Uh, and there's some debate about this line, they pierced my hands and my feet. So most translations translate it just like that. That's how the King James uh, did it. And most translations follow that, uh, that translation. The New King James, the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, they all have pretty much the same wording there. The New English translation, the NET, says, Yes, wild dogs surround me. A gang of evil men crowd around me like a lion. They pin my hands and feet. Now, that's that sounds a lot different, doesn't it? Uh, the Good News translation <clears throat> says, An evil gang is around me like a pack of dogs. They close in on me. They tear at my hands and feet. The um, CEV, which I, I forget, what that stands for at the moment. Uh, it says, brutal enemies attack me like a pack of dogs tearing at my hands and my feet. So those are a little bit more similar, but the NET especially, like a lion, they pin my hands and feet. Where does that come from? All right, so um, we, have, we have here... Um, what, what's really a, a difference in, in text, uh, the, the sources that we're using here. So I talked last time about the Septuagint and how in the New Testament, most of the quotations are from the Septuagint, that Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. But in our Bibles, or in our English Bibles, they're generally translated from the Masoretic text. That's the actual Hebrew text of the Old Testament. In this case, most translations actually take the wording of the Septuagint because in the Hebrew, it says, like a lion, my hands and my feet, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so all the ancient translations translated this as some type of a verb. Instead of like a lion, they have it being something to his hands and his feet. Uh, and some of these, especially I think the Septuagint, use the word dug. They dug my hands and my feet. And while that word is generally about digging in the ground, uh, if it's related to hands and feet, then piercing my hands and feet seems like a good, uh, a good uh, way to put that. Uh, Brittany says the CEV is the contemporary English version. I'd forgotten what that meant. So... He says, uh, or uh, he says it, it's like a lion, my hands and my feet, or they dug my hands and my feet. So almost all translations uh, in English agree on translating this as they pierced my hands and my feet. It makes sense. Uh, it fits uh, with with what the Septuagint seemed to be be saying, as well as actually matching what happened. Uh, but this is not a passage that's quoted in the New Testament as being fulfilled in Christ. We see it being fulfilled in Christ, that they pierced his hands and his feet. Uh, because later on, you know, some people say, well, crucifixion doesn't have to be nailing, and it doesn't say they nailed him to the cross. Uh, but there's other things, you know, the, the, uh, the Old Testament in Colossians 2 uh, the Old Testament law was nailed to the cross. And uh, when Thomas comes, Jesus says, you can put your your hands in the holes in my, my hands and, and so on. So clearly he his type of crucifixion was being nailed to the cross. Uh, and so he was pierced in his hands and his feet. Uh, and so this is this is not one that I would argue real strong on if we're talking about evidence, uh, you know, prophecy for for what happened. If somebody's going to argue about the original language, no, it doesn't say they pierced my hands and my feet. It says, like a lion, my hands and my feet. Okay. 
But something bad was happening to his hands and his feet, right? That's that's clearly evident. And uh, and so the NET just said, well, let's try to <laughs> use use that imagery and say, like a lion, they pin my hands and my feet. So anyway, that's why it, it's like that there. But uh, anyway, um, uh, I, I think it's clear that that there's there's a lot in this psalm that are very clear prophecies of what happened with Jesus, and uh, and it's very strong evidence uh, for this being all planned out by God. But but I just want to let you know about that particular verse. But what is what is the main message of Psalm twenty two? We we use it in the Lord's Supper very often. We we use it to talk about the suffering of, of Christ. Um, it's a psalm of lament, as Brittany put it. But is is that the main message? What what is the main message of Psalm twenty two? So I'm going to uh, obviously I'm I'm telling you what I see when I read this but when I read this I don't view the suffering as the main message of the psalm uh it's clearly there it's very important and I think we use it appropriately when we read it for the Lord's supper and or any other time to remind ourselves of the suffering of Christ. But is that the main message? I would argue that the main message is actually God answering him. Uh, it's the the it's it's a psalm of trust. It's a psalm of of praise. Um, it's it's a it's a psalm that is is focused on how terrible things are, crying out to God, and then in verse 21 you have the transition, you have answered me. Um, and, and so from there on, it's praise because God has heard his cry. It's not about the being forsaken. That's, that's not the main point. The main point is that while he, he was forsaken, when he cried out to God, God heard him and answered him and saved him from death uh, through the resurrection of the dead. So he, he says, you have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you and so on. This is Jesus talking. He, he, is, he is talking from the standpoint of, I've, I'm suffering, all this is happening to me, save me, you have answered me, and I will declare your name. Uh, in verse 24, he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. That's another one of those lines I would use in arguing about whether God had actually turned his back on Jesus and there was a spiritual separation. He has not hidden his face from him. This is, he's talking about being afflicted here. He's not talking about being guilty of sin. That's not the forsakenness that this is talking about. That's not his situation that he's dealing with. He, uh, but when he cried to him, he heard. So, so he was afflicted. He was, he was in trouble. He was really suffering. But when he cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he cried out to him, he heard. And so he's praising God. And that is, the, I think, the main focus of this psalm, the praise that Jesus is offering in response to the salvation that God gave him in raising him from the dead. And so he, he says this is something that is going to be talked about uh, forever, forever. Uh, It'll be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. Verse 31, they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. That he has done what? Well, certainly the crucifixion of Christ 
we praise God for that because without that we could not be saved. But in the context of this psalm, it's talking about the resurrection of Christ, that he saved him from this trouble, from this death. And uh, so that, I believe, I would say, is the main message of the psalm. The suffering is important. It's prophetic. We need to, to really understand what that's saying. And without that, we don't get the power of what God did to save him from that. Uh, but, but I believe the main message is that God has saved him from this trouble. And, and so he, he's praising God for that. It's a psalm of trust. It's a psalm of praise, not only a psalm of lament. All right, so uh, if anybody wants to add anything to that, if you want to correct anything, you're welcome to do so in the comments. Uh, but, but I hope that will help us, perhaps, in our reading of this psalm, that, that we can uh, read it fully and not only read the first part and, uh, and really get, get the message of Psalm 22. All right. Let's look at Psalm 110 then. It's a Psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of, Melchil of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside, therefore he shall lift up the head. All right, so this is a, a powerful psalm. It's short, uh, but it, it's, it's talking about the power that's there in, in uh, Christ. This is, would be after uh, what we read in Psalm 22, after God has saved him from, from death, then we have... Uh, this said about him, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now, um, let me see here. Yeah. So in, in the New King James, it doesn't have it in the way that I've copied and pasted it, and I apologize for that. But I want to point out that in, in your Bibles, generally, like there in verse 1, the Lord... Lord would be in all capital letters, like maybe smaller capital letters, but they'll be all capital letters. Uh, but it it's, can be confusing sometimes. That's the name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh or however it was pronounced, which generally it wasn't pronounced uh, by the Jews. But, uh, but if we look at some other translations like the American Standard Version, not the New American, but the old, older one, it, it has Jehovah in the translation. And so it's a little bit easier to see. So here it says, Jehovah saith unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Jehovah will send forth the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Uh, and then in, in verse 4, Jehovah has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, so the Lord, then in verse 5, is not the word Jehovah. The Lord at thy right hand will strike through kings in the day of his wrath. All right, so using that, I'm, I'm going to show you back at, with the new, uh, new King James. I'm going to highlight some things to try to help us break break out this psalm a little bit. Uh, but before that, as we've read through here, uh, question number four is, according to this psalm, who does Jesus rule over? So, who does Jesus rule over? And maybe that's a, 
it depends on how you take that uh, as to how you might answer it, but I thought that might be an interesting question to, to think about here from Psalm 110. All right, but here in, in yellow, I've highlighted where it should, as far as I can tell, it's referring to Jehovah. And then in green, where it's referring to my Lord. All right, so the Lord, Jehovah, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So Jehovah is saying, sit at my right hand. Uh, when we get to verse 5, it says the Lord is at your right hand. So it seems that at verse 5, it's starting to speak to Jehovah. It doesn't use the word Jehovah here, but the your, who's at your right hand? Well, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So uh, if we're saying the Lord is at your right hand, it seems that the Lord here is the same as my Lord in verse 1. And uh, your is Jehovah, the Father in this case. Um, there's other places that talk about Jesus as being Jehovah, such as Psalm 102, that Hebrews 1 applies to Jesus. Uh, but, uh, but in this case, Jehovah is really referring to the Father. Uh, and so he, the Lord, the Father, said to my Lord, Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And this is one of those passages that gets used a lot in the New Testament. Um, in, in Matthew 22, uh, verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, Who do you think, of, uh, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him any more. So Jesus uses this passage to... to uh, demonstrate that these people didn't know as much as they thought they did. <laughs> uh, but but it, he's not saying that there's any contradiction here. He's just saying, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but whose son is he? He's the son of David. That's clear in the scriptures. That's the Christ would be a descendant of David. But a descendant isn't going to be Lord over the father, right? Uh, the, so how can the one who comes from David be Lord over David? And they apparently understood that Psalm 110 was referring to the Christ. Uh, and, and so he, he doesn't argue about that. He just asks them, how can it be that he says about the Christ that he's Lord? The Lord said to my Lord, how is he calling him Lord? And of course, we know that Jesus is Lord of, of David because he was God. He, he's, he was before Abraham. He was from eternity, and he is Jehovah. But, uh, but anyway, they didn't understand that. We're looking at it from the standpoint of those who've had it explained to us in the New Testament. So that's why we understand it. But, but they didn't get it at this point. In Acts chapter 2, verse 33 through 36, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so he, uh, Peter uses uh, this in this first sermon uh, on the day of Pentecost, this first gospel sermon, uh, as we generally put it. Um, 
he's, he uses this quotation to say, well, David isn't the one that ascended into the heavens. He said, my Lord is the one who is going to sit at the right hand of the Lord. Hebrews 1, verse 13 and 14, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? So he's making a distinction between Jesus and the angels by using this very same quotation. This was never said of angels. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. All right, so nobody uh, has answered question number four um, about uh, who does Jesus rule over. I'm going to go ahead and put question number five in here. Uh, what two positions of authority does Jesus have according to Psalm 110? Um, so let's go back here and... Uh, there's nothing in at least this translation that says anything about him ruling over anybody specifically. But we see in verse 2, rule in the midst of your enemies. Um, in, uh, in verse 5, he shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. In verse 6, he shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. So, in the sense of having the power and authority and, and strength to go in and, and defeat his enemies, he's ruling over his enemies. Uh, it's certainly not a, a position of blessing, of uh, being under his his kingship as his enemy, it's a it's a position of destruction if you're his enemy. But but he is ruling over them in that sense. But also in verse three, he says, "Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power." And so he says that those who are in his kingdom, in the sense of being blessed, being receiving the privileges of his kingship, uh, those are going to be volunteers. So it's only those who who put themselves in that situation who volunteer to be in his kingdom, who will be in his kingdom in that sense, in the sense of the blessings of his kingdom. Uh, but the idea is, Jesus will have the, the power, the beauty of holiness, uh, the, the authority and the, the, that, that people are going to want to be in his kingdom. Not everybody, obviously, because he's going to judge and fill the places with dead bodies, but there will be plenty who will volunteer to be uh, with him, under him, under his authority in the day of his power. And that's certainly where we want to be. We want to be among those volunteers. Nobody can force you into it. You cannot be born uh, into uh, a... You can't be raised in the church. We'll put it that way. I know people use that term all the time, and I understand what they mean by it. But literally, you can't be raised in the church uh, because you have to volunteer to be in the kingdom of Christ. Uh, it's not something your parents can do for you. All right, uh, for question number five, what two things, uh, two positions of authority does Jesus have here? Uh, Brittany says priest and king. Now, he doesn't even use the word king here, does it? But it's clearly here. That idea is here. This idea of ruling of executing the kings and all of this, uh, you could maybe argue that being a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, that being a priest puts you in that authority, uh, type of authority, but it's actually according to the order of Melchizedek, who was priest and king, right? King of Salem. Uh, Hebrews deals with this idea. 
And so when he's a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, that includes kingship. All right, so, so it's, he's priest and king. And we see that, that authority and power uh, shown very powerfully in this short psalm. Him executing his enemies, just totally wiping out these nations that are against him. And, you know, drinking the, by the brook from the, drinking of the brook by the wayside and just lifting up his head, the power of a conqueror who isn't worried about anything because he is in control. Uh, Tobolani says, high priest and king. Uh, and I think that, well, we, we know he is high priest. And uh, I think that's, that's something you could probably get from, from this as well. Uh, high priest and king. Okay. So he's, he's not just a priest. He is the priest. He's the high priest. Okay. In Hebrews chapter five, um, this uh, is quoted here and we'll, we'll just read from verse one as to get the context. It says, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed for God in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Of course, in another couple of chapters, he's going to go into a lot of detail about Melchizedek here in Hebrews. But one thing I wanted to point out here from our discussion of Psalm 22 is there in verse 7, talking about Jesus, it says, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears, to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. That's what he was asking God to save him from. When he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's talking about physical death. And, uh, and he was heard because of the resurrection from the dead. He was heard because of his godly fear. And uh, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. All right, so anyway, this, this helps tie a lot of that together here in Hebrews. Uh, but he uses this passage, uh, you are priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, uh, to talk about Christ being made high priest and uh, that that it was God who made him high priest. He didn't make himself high priest. Um, but he, he is one who has also suffered and learned obedience. And so he can help us uh, in being obedient as well. All right, we, we do have time, I think, to go into Psalm 45. So let's go ahead and, and do that. Um, Hebrews 1 quotes from Psalm 45. In verses 8 and 9, it says, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, 
has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All right, so there's a, a couple of interesting things here. One is that he he's talking to God, but he also says that he has a God. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Um, and so we find that this is the, the truth, that the Father is the God of Jesus. And so this is referring to Jesus. He is the God who has the throne forever and ever, who has been anointed by his God with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And we're told this is what was said to the Son. Now, when we read it, uh, a lot of people take this as really referring to the king of Israel. And uh, you you may see why as we read through it. Uh, I'm not sure if it ever applied fully to the kings of Israel. I think it's one that really is written about the son, uh, Jesus. But, but there are certain things that did apply to the kings of Israel. Uh, but I, I don't know that any of it or all of it could could actually apply to them. But let's go ahead and read it. To the chief musician set to the lilies, a contemplation of the sons of Korah, a song of love. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. King's daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty because he is your lord. Worship him. And the daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you. With gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought. They shall enter the king's palace. Instead of your fathers shall be your sons, whom you shall make princes in all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the people shall praise you forever and ever. All right, so I guess I've already answered this. And since we're running out of time, and uh, I'll go ahead and put it in the comments. But uh, if you want to answer it, that's, that's fine. Uh, but uh, who are these sons of Korah writing about here? In, in verse 1, uh, especially, I guess you can, you can answer it a couple of different ways, but yeah, so these are the, the sons, a contemplation of the sons of Korah. These are the ones who are writing it, and who are they writing about? They say that they're writing about the king, right? I recite my composition concerning the king. So they're they're talking about the king, but who is the king? It could be the whoever's ruling Israel. Some people think this is a re, uh, talking about Solomon. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's similar in a lot of ways to the Song of Solomon, perhaps, but it's not uh, not quite the same. 
Um, one of the things that doesn't, well, doesn't literally, I think, apply to Solomon, it would apply more to David, uh, is talking about how his arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. Uh, you know, your right hand shall teach you awesome things. It's talking about his power in battle. Now, that, that was a common thing to talk about with the king anyway. But I believe this is talking about God as the king. Uh, as he says in verse 6, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, yeah, there's, there, it's not that, that kings or judges were never called gods. They were. Jesus even points that out. Uh, you know, if he called them gods, how can you say I'm blaspheming by saying that I'm the son of God? Uh, so it's, it is possible for them to be referred to as God, uh, but it's, it's a little bit odd, uh, in this case, especially saying your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Um, now that could be talking about the, the line uh, the, of descendants, which of course in Christ, that's true. Uh, the line of David is eternal because of Jesus ruling, uh, for eternity. But anyway, there's, a there's ways in which this could apply to a physical king, but it applies much better to Jesus. But then there's other parts where we may say, well, I'm not so sure about that. Um, and, and this is in this particular question here. What is it about? What's this Psalm about? What's the, what is the focus of this Psalm? I mean, there's, there's the praise for the King here, but what is, what is actually being talked about here? If we look at the, the rest of the Psalm here, what is he dealing with? This is kind of a, a wedding psalm, isn't it? Where there's a, a, a queen coming to the king. This is a, a song of praise for the king and for his bride and them coming together. It's, it's similar to the Song of Solomon in, in that sense, that, that this is talking about the, uh, the, the one who's coming uh, to the king to be his wife and uh, praising her for her beauty for uh, and especially just for her relationship to the king and and what uh, how that exalts her uh, in verse 16 I I believe this is talking back to uh, about the king speaking to the king uh, from what I read this is masculine uh, uh, words that are in there in the Hebrew at this point, which makes you know that it's talking about the, the, the king now instead of the, the, the woman who's brought to him, his wife. <clears throat> so, because of this marriage, instead of your fathers shall be your sons. Uh, so, that's where his... Uh, strength will will lie not in his history not in where he comes from but in the ones who come from him uh, and you'll make them princes in all the earth and i will make your name to be remembered in all generations therefore the people shall praise you forever and ever so when we look at that part it might be at first glance difficult to understand how this would apply to jesus the daughter of Tyre coming with a gift. The, the royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. Uh, and she's coming with her bridesmaids, the virgins, her companions uh, into the palace. But this is all very similar to imagery in the New Testament, isn't it? Um, and so we... we uh, we read in the book of Revelation, of course, about the bride uh, being the the, Jerus the new Jerusalem adorned as a bride for her husband. Um, we see in Ephesians chapter, uh, well, my brain's not working real well. I think it's chapter four. 
uh, it's chapter four or five, <laughs> uh, where he talks about Christ and the church, uh, that, that, uh, that it's like a husband and his wife. And when we, you read through this, it's actually a very beautiful psalm about the relationship of this mighty king and the bride, this beautiful bride that he takes and who's exalted because of her relationship with the king. And that's what we see with Christ and his church. And uh, in verse 16, you know, this idea of the, having his sons that are made princes in all the earth, the idea that we as his children are seated with him in the heavenly places that we are ruling now with him in some sense, uh, that, that this is something that, that, is, that fits quite well with uh, Christ and the church. And of course, we know from, from uh, Hebrews chapter 5, from chapter 1, <laughs> that, that verse 6 and 7 are specifically talking about the Son. It's talking about Christ. And so, uh, you know, I, there, are, there are some passages that can apply to both and they can be used of the king and applied to Christ. But Hebrews says this was said to the son. And so I believe this is one of those prophecies that's really the whole thing is about Christ. And it's, it's about Christ and his church. Now, if you disagree with that, that's fine. Uh, but, but that's how I understand this one. Uh, and I hope that was helpful to you to go through it. It's something I hadn't really studied much before especially looking at the relationship of you know, this being a wedding psalm and the idea of Christ and his church uh, being together and the church being exalted because of its relationship with him. But anyway, we, we finished that right on time, so that, that worked out well. Uh, I think that's the last we're going to do on the Psalms. So we're going to start something next, uh, something different next time. And we're probably not going to start a series. Uh, we're probably going to do individual lessons from now on, because I'm not sure when we're going to have to stop all of these. When we get to go back to South Africa, which Lord willing will be before too long, but we still have to figure out how that's all going to work. Uh, then I don't think I'll be able to continue these classes from there. Our internet's not good enough to, to do it from there. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, we're, we'll, we'll see when that happens. We'll probably have another month at least uh, before we actually go back because uh, we still don't know how to plan it out yet. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, what we're going to start doing. We're going to start doing... We might have a couple of lessons in a row that are on a particular topic, but I don't think I'm going to start another long series uh, in, in these classes. All right, let's go ahead and say a prayer. Our Holy Father, you are enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you are hopefully enthroned on our praises as well as we are your Israel today, who have been saved from slavery, who've been taken out from uh, this death in sin. And we're so thankful to you for your son and all that he went through. And we are able to rejoice with him and, and glorify you with him for the salvation from death that you gave him and raising him from the dead we are thankful, Father, that you have uh, made him king and priest, high priest, to help us. We're so thankful that you did all of this for us, for our benefit, even though we are truly uh, undeserving, that we are nothing, and yet you have thought of us so highly, even though you made us. We don't understand all of that, how you do that and how you think of us that way, but we're thankful and we praise you for it. We pray, Father, that you would bless us with health, help us to stay safe, help us especially in whatever circumstance we're in to glorify you 
and to trust you because you have proven yourself always to be trustworthy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, Lord willing, I will see you again on uh, Tuesday. And uh, hopefully we will uh, start something interesting. I haven't figured out what we're going to study on Tuesday exactly. I have an idea. Uh, but uh, if you have a suggestion uh, that's not a long series, then let me know. Okay. Thanks a lot. God bless you. Bye.